Hello everyone, welcome to my YouTube channel Pathology Learning. I am Dr. Monica. In today's class, we will be seeing about the various morphological patterns of acute inflammation under the inflammation chapter. So starting with the first pattern which is the serous inflammation. We all know the hallmark of acute inflammation was increased vascular permeability. So when there is increased vascular permeability, the fluid which is present inside the vascular lumen is going to leak out into the extracellular space. So this fluid is going to be the one which we call as edema fluid. And in serous inflammation, this edema fluid is characteristically thin and watery. It is going to be a cell poor fluid. That is, inflammatory cells are not going to be present in this, only the edema fluid is going to be present. And it is going to be seen in, especially in body cavities or in spaces created by the cell injury itself. So, in body cavities when they form this fluid accumulation, it is referred to as effusion. So, effusion could be inflammatory or in non-inflammatory. But in inflammatory, we are seeing about this serous inflammation which is just a cell poor watery kind of fluid accumulation ok. So, I also mentioned that this fluid can also be seen in spaces created by cell injury right. So, the best example of it will be a skin blister. So, when we get any burns, so we kind of develop a blister. So, this blister is nothing but a serious inflammation only. So, this gap which is created between this epidermis and dermis no. So, this is the edematous fluid which is being collected. So, this is the blister basically and this is the best example for a serious inflammation. Moving on to the second type of inflammation which is fibrinous inflammation. So, this happens when the vascular permeability is going to be huge enough. That is the leakage is very big enough that the bigger molecules like fibrinogen is also leaked out of the vessel into the extracellular space. So, fibrinogen we all know it is a clotting factor. So, when this fibrinogen is getting activated, it is going to form fibrin which is the clot, right. So, this fibrin clot is going to appear like thin pinkish meshwork, like threads like meshwork it is going to form. Also, this fibrinous inflammation can happen when there is a procoagulant stimulus which is uh, the cause of this inflammation like cancer. So, any procoagulant stimulus can also result in a fibrinous inflammation. Here again, it can happen in body cavities as well like that of a serous inflammation uh, and uh, the best example of a fibrinous inflammation will be a fibrinous pericarditis. So, the first image is that of a fibrinous pericarditis. So, here if you appreciate, it is having some granular appearance, right? So, this brownish granular appearance is present that is because here there is going to be edema fluid along with the presence of inflammatory cells, okay? So, here cells fibrin and edema fluid is going to be present. So, this is going to give this characteristic granular appearance grossly and this is the pericardium actually which is having this uh, granular appearance and when this fibrinous inflammation is not being resolved, when this edema fluid is not being resolved, it can cause chronic inflammation and fibrosis meaning there will be uh, fibrosis between the layers of the pericardium and it can form addition kind of bands. So, in the second image if you see we can see bands of this fibrosis seen in the uh, pericardial cavity which is going to compress and obliterate this pericardial space eventually. So, this is uh, the third image is the in microscopic image of a fibrinous inflammation. So, as I mentioned this dark pink thread kind of material is there no. So, this is the fibrin material which is characteristic of this fibrinous inflammation. Here again this is an example seen in a pericarditis. There is a term called as bread and butter pericarditis. This bread and butter pericarditis is nothing but fibrinous pericarditis only. It has got this name because uh, just imagine we are taking a bread and spreading butter over it. So, two breads we are taking like that and spreading butter over it. You stick it together and then when you remove it, what happens? It is like something granular is uh, seeing projecting out of it. No, So, that is why the name of uh, uh, bread and butter pericarditis is given to this fibrinous pericarditis and it is going to be classically seen in rheumatic heart disease. Okay. Moving on to the third type of inflammation which is separative or a purulent kind of inflammation. We all must have seen a pus discharge, right? So, pus discharge is nothing but purulent inflammation only. So, this pus, what does it contain? It basically contains necrotic material along with neutrophils and edema fluid. Okay. A bacterial infection is the most common cause of this separative inflammation. 
whenever this pus is going to form a localized kind of collection it is going to be termed as abscess okay so in abscess what we have as i previously mentioned the center part will be this necrotic material and surrounding it we are going to see this viable neutrophils surrounding this we can see various vascular dilatation with congestion okay so this is the classical appearance of an abscess and the best example of a separative inflammation will be an acute appendicitis moving on we'll see about ulcers ulcers are nothing but the excavation of a surface of a tissue so remember the word surface the surface of the tissue alone is eroded because there is an injury causing inflammation and necrosis so this necrotic inflammatory material is being removed so it is going to form an excavation of the surface so that is what we call as an ulcer so it is nothing but an excavation of the surface of a tissue and here uh, we have four layers in an ulcer starting with the first layer which will be the necrosis the second layer will be the inflammatory cells the third layer will be a granulation tissue which is going to be composed of this inflammatory cells along with new blood vessels and fibroblasts so granulation tissue will be the third layer and then the fourth layer will be a fibrosis which is a chronic process involved in repair of this ulcer so the four layers of ulcer will be necrosis inflammation granulation tissue and fibrosis so today's video we had seen about the various morphological patterns of acute inflammation and their examples along with their images so what is the final outcome of this acute inflammation this inflammation can either resolve or it can go into a repair or organization by fibrosis or when the inflammation is not getting subsided uh, as the stimulus is persistent it can still further proceed on to a chronic inflammation and that is what we'll be seeing in the next video so see you in the next class kindly subscribe to my channel if you like my content and also uh, share it to your friends who might also benefit from my channel thank you